Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining into our third week of class. Uh, welcome to all the online students as well as all the students who joined us uh, on the e-learning portal. Um, we're at our third week. We've uh, looked uh, initially at uh, two important chapters. We've, the first week, we did look at um, counseling, biblical counseling. We uh, looked at some of the elements of uh, uh, what is biblical counseling, the elements of um, Christian biblical counseling, uh, the, uh, the attributes of a Christian counselor, and we looked at some principles. Last week, we did uh, largely focus on understanding the personality of man, you know, to understand how God has made us. Um, and uh, uh, in order for us to counsel, in order for us to be in the helping process of that uh, relationship, we need to understand uh, who man is and what what uh, what is a personality of man. And that's what we looked in um, the last week. So, um, uh, as a quick recap, uh, just just to highlight some points that we spoke about last week, we did we did talk about. Um, I think the first thing that we spoke about how uh, um, the nature of God. We understand when we understand or we come to a place of knowing who God is, who what the nature of God is the attributes of God, we do understand where we get our image from, because our image, we are made in the image, we are image bearers, we are made in the image of God. And as a result, we are made um, in, in, the, in the likeness uh, of, this, of, of the similar nature of God. So we also spoke about how, uh, how do we understand man? And why do we need to understand man? The need to understand man is because when something is broken, you need to learn how to fix something. And uh, the best way to look at it is the way that God has made us and how, um, how we are being restored. So some of the uh, important points that we looked at is that people are moral agents, free moral agents. There is eternity in the heart of every man. And that God also has given the right, uh, the, uh, the uh, person or the man to choose his destiny. So although we make a choice, we could we can make a choice, we are we don't have a right to choose our consequences. So that's part of it that we looked at. We also spoke about um, how through the fall, what were core attributes of man, which was to be loved, uh, uh, that is self self image, to be loved, to be accepted, to be secure, and to be significant all came as attributes inherent in the image that we were created. But after the fall, these attributes became needs. And this is what man keeps looking at fulfilling for himself. Um, so wherever these needs are in met, we did see that that's the cause of certain psychological, uh, emotional, or spiritual problems. We also spoke about how um, we, uh, uh, we, we need to understand human functioning through five areas. We spoke about the spiritual being, the rational being, the volitional being, the emotional being, and the physical being. We also spoke about how uh, the needs of man, needs become very strong motivators into behavior. And we looked at three needs, casual needs, critical needs, crucial needs. We differentiated this, but the most important that we looked at are the most profound basic longings um, or needs of the human heart is uh, the need to be secure, the need to be significant, and the need to be loved. Um, uh, and when these aren't met is when you would find uh, issues or, or, or problems. The only way of restoration is through Christ and through uh, living uh, out of what Christ has done for us so that we can come back to the attribute of what um, uh, God made us to be. Okay, So that was what we looked at. Uh, and I just brought it about in a nutshell for us to really um, you know, just keep our, uh, keep our minds jogged in as we keep going forward. Okay. 
Um, just before we continue, I hope there aren't any questions because you know it's important to understand. And I hope you all took some time to read through chapter the second chapter, um, and uh, because it's it's important to uh, to have that that understanding, right? Okay. So just a brief. Uh, stop of any questions, any thoughts. Uh, maybe you all reflected on what was uh, learned last time. And you know, you have any kind of questions or any contributions right now. I'll just give you two minutes as I just um, upload my screen. So uh, a, a quick one minute break to hear from you all if there is anything specific. Please go ahead. Nobody has anything to say? OK. All right. So either I've done a terrible job or I've done a really good job. I don't know which. We'll probably know once uh, the, we have an assessment that comes up. <laughs> OK. All right. Uh, so today, in, uh, in class today, we are, we're going to be moving to the, to the third uh, chapter. Um, and the third chapter starts with understanding about the basic relationship uh, in, in counseling, OK? Uh, what, what, we, what we describe as therapeutic relationship. I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, OK, I think you can, yeah. So what we describe as uh, as a therapeutic relationship, if you're following through with your notes, I'm on page uh, 15, OK? I'm on page 15. OK, so uh, today we'll, we, I'm hoping to cover two chapters. The for This one is a fairly simple one, but nevertheless uh, quite foundational to the counseling relationship that we begin to uh um enhance with with a counselor okay uh, counseling right so when we're looking at the meaning of a counseling relationship it uh, this is the the word therapeutic also means you know it comes from the word therapy or in uh, or in broader terms counseling and and think that's enough for us to understand at this point of time so a therapeutic relationship is what we also call as a counseling relationship so what is the counseling relationship? It is the relationship between a counselor and a counselee. And this relationship is a relationship of helping. It's a, it's a helping relationship. It's a relationship that enables the growth and the, um, and the change in, in the person uh, that, that you are helping to counsel. OK? So um, one of the main, uh, okay. So one of the uh, very main um, factors about a counseling relationship. So I said therapeutic or counseling relationship is a relationship between a counselor and a counselee. Okay, and one of the main factors that's important in a therapeutic relationship is the ability for the counselee to trust the counsellor and also the ability of the counselee to be open to the counsellor. Now, this can happen either in a one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, relationship, that is, you know, a counselee as an individual meets with a counsellor, or it can be in a group. So there are group counseling also but but right now our focus is mainly on one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling sessions but group uh, sessions are also uh, a big part of counseling okay but we are just focusing on one-on-one -on -one relationship one-on-one -on -one counseling so the the biggest characteristic of uh, uh, of the therapeutic relationship is the ability of the counselee 
to feel a sense of trust, to feel a sense of, uh, uh, of being comfortable enough to be able to open to the, to the counselor. And that, this ability for the counselee to trust and be open to the counselor has certain attributes or needs like a, a good environment for the counselee to, to build trust and to have to be open. Okay. It's only in that kind of an environment that the counselee can be helped to work through whatever struggles or problems or issues that they have and also be in a place to discover uh, solutions to their problems. So when a counselee comes to you, the, the first and foremost, I think, if, if you're looking at it as a percentage, a great percentage of, um, uh, of the, uh, of, of, let's call it, the outcome or the success of a counsel, counseling session happens in this relationship that needs to be developed, that needs to be enabled. And that largely comes from the counselor. Okay. So the counselor, counselee needs to be in an environment where they can trust and be open to the counselor, where they can experience the freedom or the, um, the ability to, to trust and work alongside with the counselor on their problems or their struggles so that they can find solutions or uh, different potentialities that will change the course of their lives. So that's extremely important. And that's why you know the focus of this counseling relationship is quite important while we go through this this kind of a uh, you know kind of an understanding so a counseling the counseling becomes effective when the counselor uh, has certain qualities and skills that will encourage the growth in the counseling so looking at it as a as a christian counselor yes it is very important to, which is what we looked at in the first uh, first class, right? That uh, being being uh, prayerful, uh, being someone who is seasoned in the word, um, having yeah, having um, being someone who's seasoned in the word, uh, having a, a, a good prayer life, being able to. Um, uh, have that relationship with the Holy Spirit where there is that discernment. So all of that is, is a big part of, of uh, counseling. In addition to that, there is the, the, the personal qualities of the counselor that really also helps in encouraging growth in the counseling. Okay, so, so there is that part of the spiritual um, uh, growth of the counselor, but but also there is the 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 person, the counselor as a person, the qualities of the person that that helps in the growth of the counseling. So for a relation for a, a counseling for counseling to be effective, you know, to be to to have the components of the process that you have in counseling for it to be effective. The counselor's personal qualities is very important for the counselee to grow or to discover or to bring about change. Now, it's just not the personal qualities of who we are as people, but yes, also the skills. And the skills are what we are going to be learning hereafter, Okay, uh, uh, starting from the next class on uh, the class after. Right. But the, today we are going to be looking at the ability or the qualities that's extremely important for a um, for a counselor. So one of the most important goals or the, the task, as we call it, you know, what what is it that we are called to do is 
to for the counselor to provide that relationship to build that environment that will help your counselee to really discover themselves and also begin to act in a way that helps them through their struggle so that is the goal of a, a counselor is to is to create an environment where they are able to discover what is going on within themselves and help them to move to a better or a more fruitful way of thinking and behavior now this is all uh in the uh, what do you say in the um <clears throat> in the overall uh, um, understanding or overall help of what god gives us uh, helps us to do okay but as a as a counselor i need to ensure that there is a good environment a good milieu a good place where my counselee can have the freedom to be able to discover themselves and also come to that point of change or come to that point of transformation through the power of god through the power of the word okay so it is the power of god the power of word is the overarching thing as a as a counsel, counselor i provide or i need to be there to give to help them get that in mind okay so what is this what is the function of a good counseling relationship one it creates that atmosphere of trust there is a trust that become that that builds up it provides a medium of effect in the sense of it it's a place where there there needs to be influence there needs to be impact there needs to be change right and that comes really by the quality also the personal qualities of the counselor it also uh, shows the counselee what a healthy interpersonal relationship looks like right what because a lot of things that your counselee learns is also from the way you as a counselor respond or behave or treat them or respect them that's how they are learning uh, to to pick up certain attributes that actually helps them in their own uh, own uh, relationships outside of the counseling relationship so the more respect the more acceptance the more um support the more empathy uh the the ability to really draw questions all of that helps to build a good relationship a good interpersonal relationship with your counselee and of course an important thing of the counseling relationship is that it should motivate change that's one of the what you call it it's it's like a um it's like a marker or it's like a measure that you see that there is change happening in the life of your counselee so when they come here with a problem are have they moved from where they were to into a different place not always solutions or outcomes may be the answer but just a personal change or just a change in the way that they're thinking or the way that they're feeling or their perspective understanding that in itself is a good marker that you know that this relationship the counseling relationship is being affected so these are some of the functions of the of of the relationship okay so um what we are going to look at uh, uh, specifically today is um the attitudes of a counselor or a therapist what are the attitudes that a counselor should be having as they deal with a counselee okay and if you if you look at this sentence it says more than the orientation that is more than your approach or more than your you know whatever theoretical uh, whatever theories or whatever models you're using more than all of that what really helps in counseling is the attitudes and feelings of the counselor i'm not saying that the approach or um, what you use as a tool is not important it is but more than that it is you as a person the way that your you treat your counselee the way that you feel about your counselee is what really uh, 
shows what the outcome is. Like, for example, um, is um, uh, maybe you have someone sitting in front of you who are leading a lifestyle totally against um, what, what you know God desires. OK? Now, in your mind, if the attitude that you have towards the person is, OK, um, this person will never change, or if he's going to continue to lead a lifestyle like this, you know, there's definitely going to be a ruin. Um, you know, it's, he's probably the worst sinner that I've come across. So it really depends on what you are thinking and what, what your attitude is towards them. Because your attitude can be perceived by your counselee, right? And it makes that difference. So the way that you think or the way that you feel towards your counselee can be picked up by your counselee. I mean, I think this is a, you know, even when you are dealing with people, uh, let's say, people that you know, right? People that you may deal with on a regular basis. Um, something sometimes tells you that maybe the person you're talking to has been put off or, you know, that they are, they're a little cold that day, right? So you, you pick up, uh, uh, you pick up the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the emotional environment of the person that you're talking to. So the way in which your attitude will be perceived will be will definitely make a difference to your counselee. And that's why it's so important to keep in check how we think and how we feel about our counselees. OK, it's it's really, really important to do that. OK, so one of the studies uh, by a person by name Goldman, he said that the best predictor of a successful uh, counseling session is the quality of the relationship between the counselor and the counselee. OK, so more than what kind of therapy is used, the qualities, um, uh, the quality of the, of the relationship is more important than anything else. And that, of course, reflects back on the qualities of the counselor. So, so more maybe you're a, you're a, you're a very uh, kind person, you're a very empathetic person. But if it is not, um, if it is not communicated uh, in the sessions or communicated in your counseling, uh, the, 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 predict, the prediction or the, the, it's not as good as a predictor than, um, than having that good relationship between your counselor and, and between you and your counselee. OK, so more than the kind of therapy that's used or even the problem or even you as the kind of person you are, none of that is good enough. But what really predicts a good outcome of a counselling uh, session is the way that the relationship happens over there, the ability um, for the counselee to trust you as well as for the counselor to be able to be to have certain good attitudes, which is what we are going to be looking at largely. So there are three important uh, attitudes that that's very key in in the way that um, we focus on that counseling relationship. So there are three. One is empathy. The second is uh, unconditional positive regard, and the third is um, genuineness. Okay, and we will go through each of them one by one. Okay, so it's empathy. It is the. It is also um, uh, unconditional positive regard and genuineness. Okay, so let's look at what empathy is. Now, empathy. If, if you look at the word empathy, and, and we, we will be looking at it a little bit more uh, also a little later, because this is very, very important in counseling. OK, it is a way of being with your counseling. It is the way of being. All right. You, you it's not it's not a put on, but this is the way that you are. You are able to put yourself in the shoes of another person. You are able to feel 
for what the other person may be may be thinking may be feeling may be going through right it is it's almost as if you you you're able to understand and and um uh experience what the other person is going through that's what empathy is okay and how do you communicate empathy is first of all by listening you need to listen to a complete story or a comp or whatever is happening in their lives understand it and also be able to communicate that understanding back okay so with uh, with uh, uh, let's suppose there is a, <clears throat> a person who comes to you and telling you about how difficult their life is in their family. All right. So how do you express empathy? First and foremost is by willingly listening. Right. The minute you give advice in the word go, you've heard. OK, I've had, uh, you know, I'm having problems with my with my family none of them love me and the first maybe your first advice for them is okay i just want to know uh, what you think about them or how much do you love them in turn you've gone into a place of not listening right so empathy can be can be done or can be communicated first and foremost by absolutely listening without judgment okay then coming to a place of understanding while you're listening, you're understanding, and also you're communicating that understanding. Another thing about empathy is how your understanding comes from the framework of the other person's life or world. And this is what we're going to be looking at uh, the class after. Uh, what is the, your understanding will come not from your own experience or your own um, thoughts or the way that you have dealt with a similar problem, your understanding comes from actually uh, placing yourself in their world, from the framework of their world, of their experience, of their issues. That's where empathy begins. Uh, em uh, that, that's how important empathy stands on okay for for you to step in and that's what empathy is stepping into the shoes of another person and being able to see the world like they have been able to see it okay so that's that's what empathy is is so why is it important it is important for the uh, counselee because they begin to to sense and feel you know hey i am a person that has been understood or understandable. I am understandable. Now, remember, when counselees come to you, uh, they've come to you because in the environment or the situation they are in, they feel misunderstood or they feel nobody understands them or nobody um, has taken the trouble to know where they are in their problem. Right. So when you show empathy, they it becomes important for them because they begin to see, OK, I am important enough that someone has chosen to understand me, chosen not to judge me, but but come to a place of uh, knowing and understanding what is going on with me. And when you do that, what happens is it increases their own self-esteem. They begin to see themselves as important, as valuable, because you have paid attention to their struggles, paid attention to what they're saying, and not placed a judgment. So that's why it's important. They come to a place of knowing that they, they are understandable, and as a result, it increases their self-esteem. Why is it also important? It shows that I, I am, me as a counselor, I'm taking the pain and uh, you know all that I have and the willing the willingness that I'm communicating that you know I really want to understand what your struggle is. I really want to know what your problem is, right? And that's what I'm also communicating. 
And so when I communicate that, it begins to show them that I am important. I'm a person. I am a being. I'm a human being that is important to the person who I'm talking to. So if they are going to be telling you something, but you're not delving into the into their feelings or into their thoughts or into their innermost um, musings, what happens is you've got a very, very superficial uh, problem at hand. You've got a very superficial understanding of the problem at hand. But when you are asking questions, when, when the questions actually help them to delve deeper, they begin to see that they are important. They begin to feel and see that, OK, I am a person who's important to my counselor. Now, that's why uh, there is, it's so important to, to build that kind of empathy. OK, so what does this empathy do? A couple of things. It builds the relationship between you and your counselee. OK, when you empathize, it actually helps your counselee to explore more about who they are or why they think the way that they do. Why are they feeling like this? What is the struggle that they are going through in their situation? It actually helps them to explore a lot more deeper into who they are. And this all happens through a conversation. It all happens through a communication. OK? And you will get to understand how and uh, how how that that comes in okay even as we uh, as we progress another function of empathy is when you are empathizing with someone you're actually checking to see whether you have understood what they are going through right um like for example um you know someone comes in and tells you about uh, uh, about um maybe let's say uh, for for example, uh, uh, let's say uh, one of their pet died. Okay, one of maybe a, a dog or a cat. Some some uh, where they have a very strong uh, liking, affection to let's say to a pet. Right. So they're telling you about how how their pet passed away and pet died and how it has affected them. Okay. Now you may not be in a position to really understand the depth of what it means for that person to lose their pet maybe you know in your understanding it isn't a big thing it's only a, it's only a pet after all right but when you have considered or when you communicate that the pain that they're going through is is valid right and how you how do you do that so they're saying you know, my pet passed away and uh, I'm, I'm feeling um, my pet passed away and it's been difficult. So how do you how, how do you empathize? So, you know, I, maybe I'd say something like, you know, I can see that uh, that this pet meant a lot to you and you are absolutely devastated by the loss of your pet or, you know, you're, you're finding it extremely hard to cope. I do see that you you seem to be missing your pet so much that it's it's really become a struggle for you so what am i doing i am communicating what i've heard and i'm trying to check to see if that's exactly what they are feeling right so if if i were to say that maybe you will get an answer like exactly nobody has understood how difficult this is for me everyone thinks i should just move on but it's been really really painful Right? So what are they doing? They're actually going into the depth. They're exploring the depth of that pain, all through maybe just the way that the counselor has empathized with them about what they may be going through. Right, So you're checking that understanding to see whether the way that you empathize is what's actually meant to them. Sometimes, you know, when you're doing that, they may say, no, no, no. Uh, you know, I'm actually, uh, it is difficult, but then there is something else that's been more difficult. Um, my, uh, you know, my, my, my daughter has, has been really devastated by it, and I just don't know how to help her. So, that, so there, you know, while I've, while I've tried to explore, there is something else that's come out. I, I do see that, you know, she seems to be okay, but she's worried about what the death of the pet has meant for her daughter. And, and so it checks an understanding. So it is important for us to be empathetic, to really, one, explore deeper, 
to check understanding. And while you are empathizing, of course, the most important thing that you are doing is providing that support and providing that help to saying, hey, there, I am here with you. I'm I'm here to take you through this to through this difficult season. Okay. What else does it what else does it do? It helps to um, it helps in your communication, right? It enhances the communication. In fact, you will you will um, the, the fact that your counselee will talk a lot more about that one situation when you empathize is you know is sometimes it's mind blowing that they can actually talk about what it means um, for them. You know, so it actually builds that communication. It also helps your counselee to focus attention on maybe the core problem. The more that you empathize, the more deeper and deeper and deeper they can get to the problem. Remember the last time we spoke about peeling an onion, right? So it, it's not just the outside or the peripheral issues that you're dealing with, but something that's going uh, much, much more deeper. OK, so uh, that's important for them to focus on or to come to the central point of what seems to be a biggest concern for them. OK, uh, also the function is when you are um, empathizing, you're actually you restrain yourself from giving advices, you restrain yourself from becoming like a detective. Remember, as a counselor, you're not a detective. You're not only trying to find out you know, what is the entire uh, uh, context of their problem. It keeps you, when you're empathizing, it keeps you from becoming a detective. You are, uh, you are attempting to really spend time in understanding their feeling or their thoughts of the problem. Okay. The, the next thing, it, it also helps them pave the way. It paves the way for the next, uh, for going into the next issue. Okay. So remember that empathy, empathy is not sympathy. Okay. Sympathy is when you are at a distance, you're looking at the problem from a distance. All right. That's what sympathy is. It is not empathy is very different from sympathy. Sympathy is, you know, it's you're not involved. You're not uh, you're showing a very standoffish um, uh, uh, posture position to them that, oh, you know, it's really sad that you're going through this. I poor, poor you or, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's unfortunate that you have to do this. You know, it's it's that kind. It's a very, very impersonal. Uh, experience to sympathize. So um, it, it's 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 important to to come to that place to see. Now the person who bought about these three attitudes was a person by name Rogers. So you will Carl Rogers, and you will see his name in a lot of things because these are some of the things that he's written about. Okay, uh, uh, empathetic being empathetic is to see the world as if as if like the other but realize that I am not the one who's experiencing what he's going through. So you're seeing the world as if you are seeing it like your counselee, but knowing and understanding that you are not the one experiencing it. OK, so you're, you're seeing it like that, but also having the judgment to know that you are not experiencing the same thing. OK, now it is like, like we were talking about in one of the principles, you know, you can experience the quality, quality and depth of the other person's what they're feeling without actually feeling the same way yourself. You know, you know what it means to be angry or to be fearful or to be sad without actually feeling angry or depressed yourself. If you rem remember, one of the principles we spoke about was controlled emotional involvement. You are involved. You are experiencing the depth and quality of the emotion, but you are not so involved that you are feeling it that you get charged yourself. So that there is that difference in no, in understanding that kind of an empathy. Okay. Now, how is uh, how is empathy expressed? 
Now, this is almost like a formula, but it's uh, but you will see that a lot of times we use this. You feel dashed because dash. For example, you feel devastated because your dog died yesterday, or you feel um, you feel confused because you do not know how to handle your daughter because she's grieving so uh, so much for for her for her pet. So this is the formula that you would use. You feel dash because dash. Okay, so that's that's empathy. Um, I wanted to you know take some time to probably. Um, uh, mm, maybe I think we'll do that. Let's try. I'd like you all to write down on the chat if you all are okay to unmute. Um, what would be your response? I, and I want you to say it as you would you would you would be talking to this person. Okay. Uh, let's look at. Um, I have been diagnosed with cancer. What would be an empathetic empathetic response that you would give? So if you could quickly, without wasting too much of time, uh, put what you would say to a person who's telling you, hey, you know, I have been diagnosed with cancer. What would you say? You can put it on the chat, OK? So I'd appreciate if you can quickly do it so that we don't waste time and we can move forward. Don't worry about wrong answers, OK? OK, so Ravali writes, I'm so sorry to hear that. OK? Others, if you want to unmute, please go ahead and do that. Come on, come on, come on, quick, quick. How would you respond? I don't have any words to say. OK, Sri Radha said that. All right. Hello, yes, Anil. Mm. Uh, go ahead. So it's like a Christian field or uh, in a circular way, like he's a believer. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it okay, doesn't if, matter if you're dealing with a believer or a, or a secular person. What would you respond that if, shows empathy? If he's a believer, we can say like, like I, I would say like, OK, God is with you. Like you can believe on him. Uh, God will help you to overcome this and all give the faith on him. Like you're going to reach a promised land and all. But like okay. I, for other people, I don't know what to say. OK, OK, thank you. That's Francis, I guess, right? Mm, OK, yes, ma all right. OK, OK. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anthony, what would you say? OK, Jacqueline says, uh, yes, I understand that it's a ter terrible thing to know, but please don't lose hope. This is not the end of everything. OK, Anthony said, oh, so sorry to hear that. The Lord is your strength. OK, all right. Anybody else? OK, so when now none of these answers are bad, OK? Uh, and a really good, excellent attempt. Um, so one of the one of the things when we are empathizing, remember sometimes some of this comes to us as a shock. That uh, I think, like Sri Radha wrote it, I don't I don't know what to say, and maybe we say that I don't have any words to say. When you're in a position of being a helper, like a counselor, um, they are looking to you for an understanding, right? So, so, and and I'd like you to keep away this thought of okay, whether they're believer or whether they are not non-believer. I think our approach should be the same whether they are believers or non-believers. Um, like I said, when they're telling you something, yes, hope and no fear and faith all have a place. They all have a place, but. There is a timing. There is a timing for how and when we say something. OK, I think Prince wrote, is it? It must be hard to take in. OK, wonderful. So remember, when someone is bearing out their heart to you, they really would like, yes, encouragement and hope, all of that. They want to know whether I am being understood. Do you understand 
the kind and of pain that I'm going through. That's what they want to know more than anything else. OK? So where, where all of your answers did definitely show that you have to give hope. It has a place, like I said, but there's a timing for that. So when someone says, I have been diagnosed with cancer, there are certain things. And one is a great one, which Prince has written. You know, this must be a very, very hard news to bear or hard news to take. Or this can seem like this is the end of the road. This can seem extremely devastating for you. Right? So what are you doing when you're doing that? Is that you are only, um, you're moving at the pace of your counseling and not going ahead. So some of our answers here, we've gone way ahead, right? You know, okay, you know, God will take care of you, promised land, uh, you know, the crown of life. All of that is way, way ahead. But there is a time and a pace for that. So when someone's sharing something with me, I want to stick to what they have said. Like, for example, my son didn't do, okay, let's look at the second one quickly. My son didn't do well in his second PU exams. What would you, what are some things that you could quickly, you know, this is practice. Remember, we need to practice this. If not, it's going to be, uh, we won't know how to work through this. Okay. So let's look at the second one. My son didn't do well in his second PU exam. What would you say? Come on, quickly, quickly. Don't think too much. Just, just quickly, quickly put it on. OK, um, Shri, uh, Radha's written, I know it's hard to accept and it's very sad. But in this situation, he needs his parents more than anything so that he may get the courage and may overcome this failure. OK, great. So great, uh, Radha. So um, I'd, I'd say you know it's good to stop at the first one. I know this is hard to accept, and this must be very sad. Or uh, you know, I know you've had a lot of expectations for him. And to see that it is all broken down because of this must be very hard on you, right? Stop it there. Because the more that, uh, like like Radha, so what you said is, you know, he needs his parents more. She didn't say anything. She just said, my son didn't do well in his PU exams. And I'm, you know, I don't know what to do or something like that, right? So stop at where they have they have given you. Do give enough that that they need, OK? Anthony's written, get an extra teacher for him and for him to make sure he's not. OK, so here, what are we doing over here? We've given an advice, right? So is that empathy? Are we empathizing with them? Uh, have we gone past the feeling and gone way ahead of thinking about the advice even before waiting and listening and sticking with them at that point? Right over here, she's she's crying and she's saying, "My son didn't do well." And what we need to do, <laughs> excuse me, what we need to do is to communicate and say, "You know, yeah, I see that you see this is hard. I know this must be unexpected. I know this must be devastating. I know this may this may uh, look like as if there are many problems to come. Let's stick there." Let's not go beyond that. So is it clear? Have I, I, I know this is this is new, but but we will we can figure this out as we keep going. Okay. So empathy is to stick with the feeling. It is to stick with the feeling. It's not to give advice. All right. Um, let's look quickly at, at the at the last one. I can't live another day with my husband. One or two responses. I can't live another day with my husband. Sorry. Come on. If you can unmute, it'll be it'll be easier, better. Okay. So Jackin's written, you must be experiencing some difficult situations at home. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Or you can say, um, you know, you, you are you, you probably are 
finding it uh, um, extremely hard to work with your husband right now. It appears like it, it seems to be really hard, right? So when you are empathizing, remember you're not agreeing to, uh, to their problem. You're not agreeing. You are attempting to understand. OK, good. One more. One more person can respond. One more person. It seems what you're going through is hard and difficult. OK, wonderful. All right. So add more. This must be very hard for you. OK, let's stop it there, right? This must be very hard for you. You've written, but you need to trust God. Like I said, excellent advice. These are important, but for a time later. You are still listening to her emotions. So remember that when you are rephrasing or when you're empathizing, it's best you bring about an emotion. OK, so some of the responses you all brought about is you have actually said it's very hard. Rather, bring about an emotion. OK, this may be very frustrating for you. OK, so that's an emotion. Or this may be very annoying for you, depending on what the person is saying, right? Or this may be very suffocating for you. Now, these are all emotions. Because when you are bringing about an emotion, you they will tell you, no, 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 it's not suffocating. It's very, it's very painful, right? No, 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 it's not, uh, it's not confusing. It's getting very frustrating, right? So they will clarify the emotion for you and you are getting a deeper understanding so you're not you may not hit their emotion right at the beginning itself but then as you are building this empathy or you're you're communicating your understanding you are you are learning a lot more okay all right so the first one the attitude that's so important is empathy and i want to challenge all of you in your communication with anybody, don't look for someone who's telling you a problem. It can be your classmate, it can be your wife or your husband or your children. When they're coming and sharing something with you, try learning, practicing empathic responses. Begin to respond with empathy. For example, if your child comes in and says, Mama or Dada, your, uh, you know, my teacher shouted at me. What can we say? Instead of saying, what did you do? Or, you know, does the teacher want me to come there tomorrow? These are all not empathic responses, right? Rather saying, oh my, that must have been, must have been very hard on you with all your friends sitting there. That's empathy, right? Or I'm sure that must have put you at a at a terrible spot. It must have put you at a at a hard spot with all your friends sitting in class. That's empathy, right? You are help, you're trying to see what it means to her. So get off that need to solve their problem and come to a place of understanding what they are going through, what the feeling is. So practice it. Learn to practice it with each other. Maybe when those of you are sitting in class or with people at home, learn to practice it. Because to build empathy is one of the very most important things in counseling, OK? All right, let's stop for a 10-minute break. We'll come back by 11.03. It's 10.53 on my clock. We'll come back by 11.03.